In this video, we're going to cover an introduction to pharmacokinetics, looking at an overview of the four main processes which are absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. We'll also introduce some key pharmacokinetic concepts such as bioavailability, first-pass metabolism, and half-life, describe their clinical importance, and start seeing how we can measure such parameters. And then, in later pharmacokinetics lectures, we'll expand on these topics. All right, let's start this lecture by first understanding what we study in pharmacokinetics and what exactly it is. If you've seen the introduction to pharmacodynamics lecture, we studied how the drug affects the body and what the drug does to the body. This includes understanding how effectively the drug works, its mechanism of action, and how it interacts with receptors. Now, pharmacokinetics focuses on how the drug moves through the body and what the body does to the drug. We're interested in the drug's journey, including how quickly it enters the body, how it gets absorbed and spread or distributed within different body parts, and how it's eliminated from the body through metabolism or excretion. Okay, There are four main processes involved in pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, often remembered as ADME. Okay, These processes determine how the drug is absorbed into the blood, distributed to various body areas, broken down, and finally removed from the body. So the circulatory or systemic bloodstream is something we need to keep in mind because we're going to be diving into where the drug travels and how it travels in the body, looking at the drug levels in the body and being able to calculate the parameters of absorption, distribution, and elimination. So now let's subtract complexity and go through an overview of drug absorption. Drug absorption, it's, it's the process by which a drug moves from its site of administration into the bloodstream, making it available for the body to use. This is important to understand because in pharmacokinetics, we're interested in how much of the drug is in the blood or the drug plasma concentration, which we can measure. Now, the way a drug is absorbed depends on different factors physiochemical factors, pharmaceutical factors such as disintegration time and manufacturing variables, all right, and patient-related factors such as route of administration, age, and gastric empty. Let's go through an overview of some of these factors, starting with how it's given or the route of administration. Common routes include oral by mouth, when drugs are taken by mouth, they must first pass through the digestive system, which can affect absorption, factors like stomach acidity, presence of food, and gastric emptying rate play a role. We also have intravenous, so IV administration. This is the fastest and most direct route to the bloodstream, bypassing barriers like the GI tract. The bioavailability, which we'll go over in a minute, is usually 100% for IV drugs. We have intramuscular and subcutaneous. These injection routes involve the drug being administered into muscle tissue, okay, or just beneath the skin. The rate of absorption depends on blood flow to the injection site. We also have other routes, which include inhalation, which is rapidly absorbed, transdermally, this is on the skin, like a patch containing the drug, sublingually, this means placing a drug under the tongue, which is absorbed quite rapidly. And there are also other drugs that are administered via the eye, e, and nose. And most of these drugs are delivered locally and are not absorbed systematically, okay, systemically. This right here, okay, this is an overview of the ADME processes. We have different routes of administration and the arrows following it into the bloodstream. And we're gonna keep coming back to this overview diagram throughout this lecture. But for now, let's go through the next factor that affects drug absorption. The next factor is the drug formulation. So the form of the drug affects how quickly it dissolves and is absorbed. So solid dosage forms, tablets and capsules need to dissolve in the stomach or intestines before absorption. The formulation can affect the rate of dissolution. So some drugs have special coatings to control this process. Liquids are often absorbed more rapidly than solids because they don't need to disintegrate. All right. Food or other GI tract factors, however, can have an impact on them. And then we have Inhalation, so drugs delivered via inhalation, so for example, asthma medications, are rapidly absorbed through the lungs, large surface area, and rich blood supply. Okay, another factor that we have is blood flow. 
blood flow to the administration site greatly influences drug absorption. Areas with a rich blood supply, like muscles in IM injections, allow for quicker absorptions compared to regions with a lower blood flow. The next factor, drug characteristics. So we have lipophilicity, lipophilic fat-soluble drugs can easily penetrate cell membranes and are generally absorbed more efficiently. The size of the drugs or smaller drug molecules can often pass through barriers more easily than larger ones. And then the charge of a drug molecule can influence its ability to cross cell membranes. Some drugs are actively transported into cells while others passively diffuse. And this leads us to the mechanisms involved in drug absorption. Before a drug reaches the circulation, it will need to cross one or more cell membranes. This doesn't include IV administration because it's injected directly into the bloodstream. Okay, but why is crossing the barrier important? The presence of cell membranes act as a protective barrier for the body, all right? It prevents harmful substances, including pathogens and toxins, from freely entering into the bloodstream and affecting the entire body. Their selective permeability allows some substances to pass through, okay, while blocking others. And it also allows the body to control the and optimize, okay, to control and optimize the actions of drugs and other substances. And of, and of course, by crossing cell membranes, drugs can reach their intended target tissues or organs where they are needed to produce therapeutic effects. Now, most drugs taken by mouth so oral administration, encounter the GI tract first. So like we mentioned before, they're typically in the form of tablets, capsules, liquids, or other formulations designed for oral use. Solid dosage forms like tablets and capsules must first disintegrate, break apart, and then dissolve in the stomach or intestines. This is essential for the drug to become available for absorption, okay? Let's go through these mechanisms. So first up, we have passive diffusion. This is the most common mechanism, especially for drug absorption in the GI tract. The concentration gradient, which involves the drug moving from an area of higher concentration to a lower concentration, is what causes this. Once inside the cell, the drug can further diffuse into the bloodstream. Lipophilic or fat-loving drugs can dissolve in the lipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, which lets them move across the membrane without doing anything. Okay, so that's passive diffusion. The next type is active transport. So some drugs use active transport mechanisms that require energy to move against the concentration gradient. Specialized transport proteins, often referred to as pumps or transporters, actively, actively shuttle the drug across the membrane. This process can be selective and may involve carrier, like carrier proteins like P-glycoprotein, Okay, so that's active transport. The next one is facilitated diffusion, similar to passive diffusion, but involves carrier proteins that facilitate drug movement. So unlike active transport, facilitated diffusion does not require energy. The next mechanism is endocytosis. In some cases, large or complex molecules can be absorbed through endocytosis, where the cell membrane engulfs the drug, forming a vesicle that is internalized. So this vesicle may later fuse with other cell structures or undergo exocytosis to release the drug into the bloodstream. Now, what happens then? So once the drug has successfully crossed the plasma membrane of the cells, okay, at the administration site, it enters the interstitial fluid surrounding the blood vessels. The drug then has access to the systemic circulation. So depending on the drug's properties, it may circulate throughout the body, reaching its target tissues and exerting its therapeutic effects. So from the bloodstream, the drug can be distributed to various tissues and organs, including its intended site of action. But factors like blood flow, tissue composition, and drug binding proteins can influence distribution. Okay, we'll expand on this in the drug absorption lecture, but for now, keep in mind that the absorption process is the movement of a drug from its site of administration to the circulatory bloodstream, an example being the GI tract. Now, let's go through an important concept known as bioavailability and is denoted by the symbol. F. So think of bioavailability as a fraction, hence the F. So this fraction can be represented as a percentage or a ratio. Okay, let's break this down. 
Essentially, it's the fraction of the administered drug that reaches the bloodstream unchanged. It's a measure of how effectively a drug is absorbed and available for action. Okay, We always compare this fraction to what occurs when an intravenous IV bolus injection where the entire dose is given directly into the bloodstream. This method achieves maximum absorption since the drug goes straight into the circulation. Okay, let's draw this out. Let's go through an example. So imagine we have a 100 milligram drug dose in tablet form. As it passes through the gastrointestinal tract, 20 milligrams won't be absorbed at all and will be directly excreted. The remaining 80 milligrams are absorbed, okay, enter the portal vein and reach the liver. After metabolism, 60 milligrams are eliminated, leaving only 20 milligrams to reach the blood circulation. So let's do our calculations. The overall bioavailability for this drug given orally is 20%, okay? So we had 20 milligrams to reach the blood circulation. You can express this as both a percentage, 20% or a ratio, okay? Now, if the same 100 milligram dose is given intravenously, the IV bioavailability is 100%. Now, this is a key point to remember here, that IV bioavailability for any drug is always 100%, okay? This is because intravenous administration offers maximum absorption, okay? So to recap, bioavailability is a critical concept that tells us, that tells us how much of an administered drug actually makes it into the bloodstream. For IV administration, bioavailability is always 100% due to the direct entry into the bloodstream. So while oral and IV administration are frequently used to illustrate the concept, bioavailability is relevant to all routes of drug administration. Okay? Now, what I want to do is further compare how drugs behave when taken in different ways. So for instance, if we take a drug in tablet form, it needs to travel through the digestive system and reach the bloodstream. Now let's compare taking the same drug, let's take ibuprofen, either as an intravenous injection or as a tablet. And if we visualize this on a graph with time after administration on the horizontal axis and the drug's concentration in the blood on the vertical axis, we can analyze some key differences. We administer the same dose of ibuprofen by intravenous injection, okay, the blue curve, or as a tablet, the red curve. So this is a very typical graph we see in pharmacokinetics. At T0, T equals zero, the drug has been administered. Now this dotted line here is the MEC, okay? MEC stands for minimum effective concentration. It refers to the lowest concentration of a drug in the bloodstream that is required to produce a therapeutic effect. In other words, MEC is the minimum amount of the drug needed to achieve the desired outcome. If the drug concentration in the blood is below the MEC, it might not have a noticeable therapeutic effect. Let's examine some key things on this graph. Let's look at the onset of therapeutic action, the speed of elimination, the risks of side effects, and then what happens if we increase the MEC, the minimum effective concentration. So first up, when it comes to the onset of therapeutic action, which is when the drug starts working, there's a noticeable contrast between IV and oral administration. With IV therapy, the drug's concentration reaches the level needed for an effect very quickly, making the therapeutic response almost immediate. Okay? However, if we were to take it orally, like with a tablet, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to reach the effective concentration, delaying the drug's effect. So that's the onset of therapeutic action. Another aspect to consider is the speed of elimination. This can be observed from the slope of the concentration curve. So for IV administration, there's an initial high speed of elimination due to the higher drug concentration initially present. So this speed then decreases as the drug concentration drops. This pattern follows an exponential decay. Okay, so the rate of elimination is slower when there are fewer drugs in circulation. Therefore, the speed of elimination depends on concentration. So this means that 
For a given drug concentration, the rate of elimination will be the same regardless of the mode of delivery. Okay, so slope three here serves as an example of this, where the drug concentration is the is the same for both oral and IV administration, and the slope is the same. Okay, so the rate of elimination is the same regardless of the route of administration. Okay, now the peak drug concentration in the blood influences the risk of side effects. So with IV administration, the peak concentration here is much higher than with oral administration. So higher drug concentrations are associated with an increased risk of side effects and potential toxicity. So giving the same dose of drug intravenously carries a greater risk of side effects compared to oral administration. Now lastly, if we consider a drug with a higher minimum effective concentration, MEC, Indicating the level at which the drug becomes active, we can see how the route of administration matters. So with IV administration here, the drug's concentration exceeds the MEC, leading to an effect. However, with oral administration of the same dose, the drug's concentration might not reach the MEC, meaning there won't be enough drug in the body to produce an effect. Okay, so this concept highlights the importance of adjusting drug dosing based on the route of administration to ensure the desired therapeutic effect. Okay, so that's an overview of absorption and routes of administration. The next step is drug distribution. So in pharmacokinetics, what we call distribution is how a drug is partitioned and distributed between various body compartments. After a drug has been absorbed into the bloodstream, it spreads to various parts of the body. So drug distribution is the process by which a drug moves from the bloodstream to different body compartments. Blood, interstitial fluid, fat tissue, bone, muscle tissue, okay, and other body compartments. This reversible transfer of a drug between one location and another occurs once the drug is in the systemic circulation, in the circulatory bloodstream. Drugs can have varying levels of concentration in plasma or even enter fat or muscle tissues. This distribution is strongly influenced by several factors, such as blood flow. So organs with the higher blood flow, like the heart, brain, and liver, tend to receive more of the drug due to their rich blood supply. And then we have tissue composition. So different tissues have varying levels of fat, water, and protein. So drugs may have an affinity for certain types of tissues affecting their distribution. And then we have drug characteristics. So the size, charge, and lipid solubility of a drug can determine how well it can pass through cell membranes and distribute into tissues. So let's say if a drug is highly lipid soluble, it will be easier for the drug to cross plasma membranes, cross the endothelium and go into various tissues. And then we have protein binding. Some drugs bind to proteins in the bloodstream, only the unbound or free form of the drug can be distributed into tissues. So albumin is the primary protein responsible for drug binding in the bloodstream. Drugs can bind reversibly to albumin, which affects their distribution, elimination, and therapeutic activity. Okay. Now in pharmacokinetics, we calculate certain parameters to gain insight into where the drug goes. For instance, some drugs stay primarily in the blood, like warfarin, for instance, whereas others are more broadly distributed throughout the body, think of ethmol, okay, which reaches various places, including the brain, or they might concentrate in specific tissues. Okay, So this concept of where a drug ends up is what we mean by drug distribution. Now, there are also specific barriers that drugs have to cross to be distributed, such as the blood-brain barrier. It's the barrier between the bloodstream and the brain. So it's a highly selective barrier that limits the entry of drugs and toxins into the brain. It's composed of tight junctions between endothelial cells and restricts the passage of many drugs. Only substances that are lipophilic, lipid solubles, or drugs that are actively transported and that are taken on by a drug carrier can pass into the central nervous system and pass into the brain. Another specific barrier is the placental barrier. During pregnancy, there's a barrier between the mother's bloodstream and the developing baby's bloodstream. 
in the placenta. So this barrier controls what substances can pass from the mother to the fetus. There's also the testicular barrier. Okay, so those are the specific barriers. Now let's go through an important concept or parameter in drug distribution called the apparent volume of distribution, which quantifies how drugs distribute within the body relative to their concentration in the blood plasma. Let's go through this. So it's a measure that helps us understand the extent to which a drug is distributed beyond the bloodstream, okay, into various tissues and compartments. Now, it is called apparent volume, okay? It doesn't actually represent a real physical volume in the body, but it's a mathematical concept used to help understand how extensively a drug has spread beyond the bloodstream, okay? So in other words, we're asking where in the body is the drug accumulating? Is it in the blood or is it in the tissue? We want to know. If a drug has a high volume of distribution, it means it has spread out into your body's tissue. If it has a small volume of distribution, it's mostly staying in your bloodstream. And we use this concept to decide how much of a drug to give to a person and how long it will stay in their body. Okay? But the thing is, why do we care about this parameter? Like, actually, like, what's the clinical relevance? It helps us understand a drug's distribution pattern. And why is this important? Because it can impact dosing strategies, duration of action, and potential accumulation in specific tissues. So we're going to expand on this in the drug distribution lecture, but for now, just keep in mind that this is a value that is going to tell us tell you where the drug goes in the body. So if it remains in the blood, if it distributes into tissues, or if it concentrates highly into specific tissues. Okay, so that's drug distribution. Now that we've covered absorption and distribution, let's dive into the next phase called elimination. We're going to see that the body will eliminate the drug over time and through different sites. All right, Elimination involves two key processes. We have metabolism and excretion. Now, it's important to understand that when we talk about elimination, we're referring to both metabolism and excretion, okay? Let's go through metabolism. Metabolism, this is my favorite subject, <laughs> refers to the body's transformation of the drug through chemical reactions. This is also known as a biotransformation. So it's a series of chemical reactions that occur within our bodies to transform medications into more easily excretable and less active forms. So this process primarily occurs in the liver, so enzymes mostly released by the liver facilitate these reactions. These enzymes vary among individuals, influencing how drugs are broken down. And factors like drug properties, blood circulation, and personal differences affect metabolism. But the question we need to answer first, before we break this down further, is why does the body metabolize drugs? Why does it do it? Metabolism, this is beautiful, serves multiple purposes, okay? So including making drugs more water soluble, hydrophilic, which facilitates the removal from the body. And another purpose is converting drugs into less active or inactive forms to reduce their effects. Let's break this down. The majority of drugs must be lipid soluble in order to cross lipid membranes and cell membranes such as epithelial membranes in order to reach the bloodstream and distribute throughout the body. Okay, so we've covered that earlier. Another thing is that the kidneys are highly effective at removing water soluble drugs from the body. So when the body metabolizes drugs, it essentially performs a chemical transformation on the drug to make it more water soluble. How beautiful is that? This alteration enables the drug to be easily and efficiently excreted through the kidneys, okay? And there are two main types of chemical reactions involved in drug metabolism, phase one and phase two reactions. Let's look at this briefly because we'll delve deeper into these reactions in the drug metabolism lecture. Phase one reactions involve introducing or exposing functional groups, which is right here, on the drug molecule, making it more reactive. So the goal is to create sites where phase two reactions can attach enzymes known as cytochrome P450, okay, typically catalyze these reactions. So that's phase one. 
Now, phase two reactions are often referred to as conjugation reactions. Why? Because in these reactions, the phase one metabolites produced the phase one metabolites produced are conjugated. They are linked to endogenous molecules such as glucuronic acid, sulfate, or amino acids. So this conjugation makes the metabolites more polar and then more easily excreted. The key idea here is that the body makes the drugs more water soluble so that they are more soluble in urine and better excreted through the kidneys. Okay, so that's the first point that we said. The second point we made was to convert drugs into less active or inactive forms to reduce their effects. When metabolism occurs, like we said, it's essentially a chemical reaction that changes the drug. These changed versions are called metabolites. The original drug is transformed into chemically altered metabolites and there can be different types of these from a single drug. There are three main kinds of metabolites. First, we have inactive metabolites. Inactive metabolites are the altered forms of a drug that result from metabolism but don't exert the same pharmacological effects as the original drug. These metabolites are often made so the body can get rid of the drug easily. They're like a safe, less active version of the original drug that can be eliminated without causing unwanted effects. The second type, we have active metabolites like prodrugs, becomes active after the body processes them. A classic example of this is codeine, which changes into morphine in the body and becomes active. So to recall the concept of prodrug, think of codeine turning into active morphine. The third kind is toxic metabolites, for instance with paracetamol, some of it changes into a toxic form due to liver enzymes. This toxic metabolite is why excessive paracetamol can lead to liver failure. Okay, so to recap, what is the purpose of metabolism? It's to make the drugs more water soluble, making these metabolites easier to excrete. However, some drugs are already water soluble they're already water soluble enough that the body doesn't metabolize them. So in such cases, the drug is excreted in the urine without changing. We'll cover specific examples in the drug metabolism lecture. Now for now, let's introduce another important concept in metabolism, which is first pass metabolism. So we know that metabolism, largely performed by liver enzymes, take place primarily in the liver. But it can also occur in other body tissues like the gut wall, muscles, and fat. Okay? For understanding first pass metabolism, let's focus on the liver and gut walls. First pass metabolism happens when a drug is metabolized before it enters the blood circulation and before it reaches the systemic circulation. This means that before the drug enters the blood and systemic circulation, the liver and gut walls partially metabolize it. This is what we call first pass metabolism. Metabolism occurring before the drug gets into the blood. So that means that a portion of the drug from the tablet will be transformed into metabolites even before entering the blood. Now let's consider different routes of administration and go through which route of administration first pass metabolism mainly occurs. So first up, we have inhalation through the lungs. This doesn't involve first pass metabolism since the drug enters the bloodstream directly from the lungs. And then we have IV administration. This avoids first pass metabolism since the drug is directly injected into the bloodstream. And then we talked about oral administration. So this has first pass metabolism as we discussed earlier. Next is the rectal route. Yes, 50% of the drug is going to go through first pass metabolism through the rectal route. And then we also have other routes like intramuscular and sublingual under the tongue, so bypass the liver before entering the bloodstream. So there is no first pass metabolism involved in these routes. So first pass metabolism mainly occurs with oral administration where the drugs encounter with the liver and gut walls can alter its composition before it enters the bloodstream. So it's like your body's way of ensuring that the medications you take by mouth won't harm you and are suitable for use. It's an essential step in understanding how drugs work in your body. All right, let's now focus on the final step of elimination, excretion. So remember, elimination covers both metabolism and excretion. Those two processes working together. 
excretion involves the elimination of drugs and their metabolites from the body to maintain proper drug levels and prevent accumulation. We've observed from our diagram that there are various points where elimination occurs, but the primary areas for excretion are the kidneys and the GI tract. So the drug can be transported from the blood to the liver, where it may be transformed or it can be combined into bile and secreted into the GI tract, where it's excreted with the feces, or it can be excreted in the urine, changed or unchanged. Most drugs are removed from the body, either without change or in altered forms, either through bile or urine. However, drugs can also exit the body in other ways, like through saliva, sweat, and tears and even when we breathe. So this means that excretion isn't limited to just the kidneys and the GI tract. Other pathways for excretion are also important to consider. All right, so that's excretion. Now let's go through some important concepts. Let's first take a look at drug dosage and blood levels first, and then we're going to explain half-life and clearance. So let's first go through the topic of drug dosage and blood levels. This is really important. So this is the key graph we use in pharmacokinetics, which is the drug concentration in the blood as a function of time after administration. Now, why is this graph important? What's our purpose here? We can't just analyze this graph without understanding why we're doing it. Well, for most drugs, there's a very close relationship between the drug levels in the blood or plasma and the therapeutic effectiveness. So we've already seen this with our initial example where a specific blood level was needed to trigger the desired therapeutic effect with ibuprofen. And what's important is maintaining the right drug concentration in the blood. So not too low to be ineffective and definitely not too high to become toxic. This range of safe and effective drug levels is called the therapeutic range. To stay within this therapeutic range, we not only have to monitor the drug's dosage, but also consider other factors like how the drug is taken, so the route of administration. Remember our previous example comparing IV injections and tablets? Different administration methods can lead to varied drug levels and behaviors in the body. Dose frequency or how often the drug is taken is very important. Taking a drug too frequently might lead to an accumulation that reaches toxic levels. This is just an introductory overview. We'll dive deeper in upcoming lectures, okay? But remember, our goal is to keep the drug concentration in the blood okay, within the therapeutic range. So to achieve this, we have to think about the dose amount how the drug is given, and how often. Other key pharmacokinetic terms like bioavailability, clearance, and half-life also play a significant also play significant roles in determining the therapeutic range. But these terms help us design suitable dosing regimes for various drugs, considering dose amounts, administration route, and frequency. Okay? But let's zoom in on this graph which is the plot of the plasma drug concentration. This graph shows the drug levels in the blood change over time after taking the drug. Along this curve, you can track the various processes we've discussed. So starting on the far left, we administer the drug at T0 and observe the drug's levels gradually rising in the body due to absorption and distribution. And eventually, the concentration in the blood reaches its highest point, known as the peak concentration. After that, there's a decrease in the drug concentration in the blood corresponding to the elimination process. On this graph, you also spot a shaded area representing the therapeutic range as we covered before. Okay, This therapeutic range defines the specific range of drug concentrations in the blood that we aim to stay within. It's crucial because it's the range where the drug is effective without being harmful. Going below this range means the drug won't work properly because there's not enough of it. And if we exceed this range, we risk encountering dangerous side effects or even toxicity from the drug. So this therapeutic range is a fundamental consideration when determining the dosing plan for a drug. Okay, so it guides us in finding the right balance where the drug is active and safe. That's drug dosage. Now let's look at half-life and clearance and how they're involved in the elimination of drugs. We'll explore this topic more in our upcoming lectures. 
But the half-life of a drug is the time it takes for its concentration in the bloodstream to be cut in half or reduced by 50%. Half-life, okay? The half-life holds great clinical significance because it helps us calculate how long the effects of a drug lasts after a single dose. We can use the half-life in various calculations, including determining how often a drug should be taken, okay? And it's also important for establishing a steady state concentration with repeated dosing, with repeating dosing. So this steady state concentration is about maintaining a consistent drug level in the blood with repeated dosing. For instance, if you're Taking a tablet every two hours to maintain a specific blood concentration, the half-life will be a key factor in these calculations. So the half-life describes how long it takes for a drug's plasma concentration to decrease by 50% or by half. Before we break this down further, let's first introduce the difference between zero-order kinetics and first-order kinetics. The rate of elimination in zero-order kinetics is constant and the drug that it eliminates are independent of drug concentrations in the body. If we were to graph this, it would produce a straight line, okay? So aspirin is an example of a drug that zero-order kinetics can eliminate. Let's move on to first-order kinetics. The amount of drug eliminated over time is directly proportional to the drug concentration in the body. The amount eliminated for each period would be different, but the fraction would be constant. So most drugs are eliminated by first order kinetics. Let's graph this out and go through half-life. So let's say we administer a drug through IV injection. Right after administration, T0, the drug's plasma concentration is 8 milligrams per liter of blood. One hour later, it's 4 milligrams per liter. After two hours, it's down to 2 milligrams per liter, and this pattern continues. Now, in this example, can you figure out the drug's half-life? The half-life in this scenario is one hour. Why? Let's go through it. Because it takes an hour for the drug's plasma concentration to reduce by 50%, okay? A highly useful rule of thumb is that approximately 95% of a single drug dose exits the bloodstream or circulatory system after 4.5 half-lives. So this rule helps estimate how long it takes for most of the drug to be eliminated from the body. Let's break this down. Imagine that your drug has a half-life of one hour. According to this rule, you can deduce that around 95% of the drug will be cleared from your system after about four and a half hours. If the drug's half-life is two hours, you can apply the rule to calculate that roughly 95% of the drug will vanish from the bloodstream after around nine hours. This rule comes in handy for quick estimations, okay? We can visually demonstrate this rule by looking at a table. Let's consider the example the example drug we discussed earlier with a one hour half-life. Initially, at T0, we have eight milligrams per liter of the drug, which represents 100%. After one hour or one half-life, the concentration drops to four, four milligrams per liter, indicating 50% remains and 50% has been eliminated. After two hours or two half-lives, the concentration is two milligrams per liter, and 25% remains, while 75% has been eliminated. So continuing this pattern, after four half-lives, nearly 94% of the drug is eliminated. And after five half-lives, approximately 97% is cleared. That's why we say that after 4.5 half-lives, we've eliminated close to 95% of the single drug dose. This rule of thumb serves as a straightforward and practical way to estimate drug elimination. Okay, that's half-life. Let's go through another pharmacokinetic parameter, clearance. Clearance represents the rate at which a drug is removed from the body, often expressed in volume per unit time. It tells us how efficiently the body eliminates the drug. Clearance provides valuable information about the body's ability to eliminate a drug. A higher clearance indicates faster elimination, while a lower clearance suggests slower elimination. We'll expand on this in the drug excretion and clearance lecture. 
For now, just keep in mind that half-life represents the time it takes for a drug's concentration to decrease by half, while clearance measures how efficiently the body removes the drug. These parameters provide valuable insights into dosing regimens and help ensure that drugs are used effectively and safely in clinical practice. Okay, those are some of the key pharmacokinetics that we'll cover more in depth in future lectures. Before we end this lecture, let's briefly go through some pharmacokinetic variations between individuals. There are several factors okay, that play a role in shaping drug elimination. To start, genetics is a key player. Enzyme production varies among individuals, impacting how drugs are eliminated. This means not everyone clears drugs at the same rate, okay? In pharmacokinetics, we often use an average half-life across a population, recognizing the natural variation due to genetics. Additionally, other substances can affect drug elimination. For instance, another medication might alter the enzymes responsible for metabolism. We refer to this as drug interactions, which is a topic we'll explore in depth later. Taking multiple drugs concurrently could affect how efficiently one drug is removed. We also have lifestyle and occupation factors, okay? So elements like diet, smoking, alcohol consumption, and exposure to industrial chemicals can impact drug elimination by altering enzyme activity. And then we have age, pregnancy, and health conditions that also play a role. The main lesson is that a variety of factors, including genetics, environment, age, and health, affect drug elimination. These intricate aspects require consideration when understanding drug behavior. We'll delve deeper into these factors in upcoming lectures. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist.